called the Imperial Home, the Metropolitan Centre, which many Caribbean writers, and Walcott included, have heeded. The Indian literary translation is perhaps most identifiable in its transnational character, while still retaining a sense of India. Indeed, the exuberant vibrancy and hybrid hybridity of South Asian writing in writers such as Rushdie, Mystery, Thoreau and Ghosh has had an extensive global impact. But for very particular reasons, the utopianism of the post-Rushdie novel uh, drives a trenchant critique of, uh, of nation. And uh, the other end of the scale, the utopianism of the tiny island nations of the Pacific rests in the vision of a region called Oceania by encompassing a high map based on traditional patterns of migration and trade, Oceania is markedly distinct from and markedly more impressive than a collection of island nations. The utopianism of indigenous people is one that exists categorically within yet beyond the nation and is also deeply invested in cultural memory. A beautiful description of this occurs in Alex Miller's Landscape of Farewell when the narrator goes with an Aboriginal man to visit his ancestral country. It was still the country of his old people, as he called his ancestors, the term familiar and intimate, as if they were not remote beings whose individual features had been forgotten long ago, but were known to him and were a people still in occupation of their lands. The old people, indeed suggested to me another way altogether of looking at reality and the passage of time than my own familiar historical sense of things in which change and the fragmentation of epochs and experience is the only certainty. The journey is later described as one made by Dugald, his uh, Aboriginal guide, to the spiritual centre of his life, a centre that exists in a place that is somehow outside of geography as it is outside of time. And in some respects, the indigenous capacity to uh, realize high map exceeds all other post-colonial um, uh, peoples. The implication of this, of course, is that nationalism, or more specifically, the post-colonial nation state, may well be incommensurable with the realities of co colonial peoples. A fact that becomes obvious in post-independent states from Africa to the Caribbean to Asia. It's this incommensurability that provides some of the energy and most of the direction of post-colonial utopian literature after the dissolution, uh, disillusion with the post-colonial nation state. If there is one thing post-colonial writers share in their very different material and cultural circumstances, it is that HIMAT is not the nation. In all these literary versions of post-colonial hope, a vision of high map in either a geographical region, a culture, a local community, a racial identity, uh, in a disruption of conventional boundaries, a dynamic operation of mem memory, and often a sense of the sacred. This high map indeed is where we can say this genre of post-colonial utopianism is located. One of the most striking uh, examples of the political utility of utopia can be seen in the Chicano myth of Aztlan. Rudolf Anaya's novel, Heart of Aztlan, captures the spirit of this myth, which was politically embedded in the pron pronouncement of El Plan Espiritel de Aztlan at the first Chicano Co National Conference in Denver in 1969. It's interesting they called it a national conference, even though it had no uh, sense of a nation state. But the nation is a people. And in 1969, uh, it confirmed, this, this uh, pronouncement confirmed three things. A Chicano identity, a homeland, and a nation. The, um, the Chicano version of utopian thinking, the Aztlan myth, proved to be a surprisingly resilient weapon in the Chicano political arsenal was because of so comprehensively united ethnicity, place and nation. It differs from other post-colonial utopias because it combined the mythic and the political so directly. 
On one hand, it was a spiritual homeland, a sacred place of origin. On the other, it generated a practical, if impossible, uh, goal of reconquering the territories taken over from Mexico. But this union of sacred and political proved to be its secret power. Aztlan, the Chicano utopia, became a focus for Chicano cultural and political identity and a permanent confirmation of the possibility of cultural regeneration. For a people dwelling in the cultural, racial and geographical borderlands, Aztlan represented national hope. The utopian function of post-colonial literatures is therefore located in its practice as well as its vision, the practice of confronting and transforming coercive power to produce an imagined future. Even in that most brutally repressed colony of our times, <coughs> Palestine, the pen might yet throw most light on the future. And now, uh, with, uh, without wanting to bring Carls to Newcastle and to th talk about the um, utility of utopia, uh, how it actually works in social transformation, I want to look at Gandhi and Hinswaraj. All those different regions and literatures indicate the variety of the utopian impulse, uh, but what is the utility of utopian vision and how is it implicated to political life? I mean, we saw the direct utility of that in, in Aztlan, but how is a vision of Heimat uh, to operate in the realities of, of national life? Uh, one answer is provided by Gandhi's vision of Hind Swaraj, one of the most potent forms of utopianism in modern times, and one with a deep sense of sacred vision. The pamphlet Hind Swaraj or Indian Home Rule, first published in the columns of uh, Indian Opinion and written in 1908 on a voyage home from London, stylistically avoids the doctrinaire by setting up a dialogue between reader and editor. In this way, utopia emerges as a conversation rather than a program which tends to domesticate its radical utopian vision, but also reinforces the fact that his utopian agenda is an ethical rather than an economic imperative. Uh, Hin Swaraj is Gandhi's Heimat. How did this locate itself in the nationalist drive to independence? Well, the reason Hin Swaraj is so interesting is that it was able to achieve what Fanal thought nationalism could not do, mobilise the innermost hopes of a whole people. It is arguable that Nehru's modern industrial socialist nation could not have been established without the utopia of Hind Swaraj. But paradoxically, this vision, so critical in the birth of Indian nationalism, was anti-nationalist, anti-enlightenment, and anti-modern. Home rule imagined an India outside any conception of the modern nation-state and India much closer to Bloch's conception of Heimat than to the modern idea of nation. Now this paradox emerges in Partha Chatterjee's foundational nationalist thought in the colonial world, which offers a thesis that the Indian drive for independence had to deal with the problematic and thematic of Orientalism. Nationalist thinking might reverse the problematic of Orientalist thought, which sees the Oriental as a passive, an essentialized subject, but still operate within the Orientalist thematic, the post-enlightenment framework of knowledge, science, and reason within which it redefines the subject. But one solution to this problem was a view of the future that steps outside uh, this uh, problematic. Um, and this uh, is, of course, Gandhi's Hind Swaraj, which was able to transcend the imperatives of modernity and of global cap capitalism and repudiate the nation state as a symptom of the problem. Ironically, this came to be seen as a foundation on which an <coughs> alternative Indian modernity could emerge. And so we go to the, the paradox of Hind Swaraj and the emergent nation 
Gandhi's conception of Swaraj is an almost perfect vision of Hyman, a classic utopia that existed by repudiating post-enlightenment thought itself. The paradox of Gandhi's Swaraj is that a utopian movement, moment so critical in the development of Indian nationalist thinking was fundamentally opposed to that modernity on which the nation was founded. For him, it's not the backwardness or lack of modernity of India's culture that keeps it in continued subjection. It is precisely because Indians were seduced by the glitter of modern civilization that they became a subject people. And what keeps them in subjection is the acceptance by leading sections of Indians of the supposed benefits of civilization. Uh, that's a uh, quote taken from Chatterjee. Uh, Swaraj is not just an attack on capitalism, but an attack on civil society itself. Industrialization would lead to the exploitation of villages, and socialism would not change this. Now, the, the fact that political change in India meant Nehru adopting the statism that Gandhi's Swaraj explicitly rejects does not alter the fact that it was the vision of Swaraj which mobilized the Indian peasantry into a sense of being a whole people. Despite the disruptions and divisiveness of caste, the, the incredible multiplicity of 3,000 languages, to put it another way, it may have been Gandhi's vision that enabled Indians to imagine a national community, the very imagined community on which Nehru built the post-colonial nation. And so paradoxical as it is, the fact still remains that Gandhiism originally the product of an anarchist philosophy of resistance to state oppression, itself became a participant in its imbrication with the nationalist state ideology. This is not the only contradiction in the trajectory of utopian thought, uh, and nor does it need to stand as an argument for or against political utility. But in the Indian case, it is one of the most fascinating. Did uh, Nehru hijack the utopian vision of Gandhi's Swaraj, or did Swaraj infuse Indian modernity with its particular character? Did Gandhi's radical vision fail because it stood so far outside the probably problematic and thematic of modernity, or did it succeed because it mobilized the innermost hopes of whole people, providing the vision and the energy for the Nehruvian nation state? This conundrum lies embedded deep in the very concept of utopia because it reveals the complex and ambivalent relationship between utopian vision and politics. What emerged was a new utopia, modern, scientific, industrial, a state that existed to provide identifiable political <coughs> economic boundaries within which the nation, the Indian transnation could em embrace modernity. What's undeniable is that Gandhi's vision and the virtually beatified memory of the man himself remain deeply imprinted on the Indian cultural psyche. Now, Gandhi's was not a literary utopianism. He is, however, was a critical utopian. And this is an important feature of utopian thinking. It's a view of the future that uh, comes out of memory, that critiques the present. And it's not a uh, literary utopianism in the strict sense, but a social movement. Yet, in its original formulation as a dialogue, and above all, its capacity to stir the imagination of a people, it functions as a form of creative thinking and provides a fascinating test case for the political utility of utopianism. In its uh, essence, it shows very clearly the distinction between nation and state because the colonial state was opposed by a concept of the nation as a whole. The science of non-violent uh, satyagraha provided for the first time in Indian politics as uh, Chatterjee an ideological basis for including the whole people uh, within the um, political nation. So, Swaraj can only come through an all-round consciousness of the masses, uh, according to, to Gandhi. But what is, what is the consequence of this? 
it's the function of, uh, as a critical utopia that inspires contemporary Indian literature. Now, the vision of de Gaulle and Gandhi uh, is still, uh, still inspires the struggle of contemporary literature with, it, with the state. Um, this is most, I just took a selection of um, uh, Booker Prize winners and um, uh, in um, uh, Rushdie himself, uh, Roy is the god of small things, Desai is the inheritance of loss, Adig is the white tiger, and Kunzru's transmission. Sketch the trajectory of the contemporary novel's extension of Midnight Children's subversion of the grand narrative of nation. The constant tension between the Gandhian sense of community and family or village and the large, increasingly global sense of history and nation that characterises these novels doesn't diminish their inheritance of the Gandhian vision of Hyman. When we examine the extent to which the post rushdie novel continues the resistance to the idea of the nation-state, three themes appear. First is the continuation in different ways of the condemnation of class and economic injustice. And Gandhi, this was most prominent in his condemnation of untouchability. But the philosophy of Cardi, or self-sufficiency, was at the same time a program of economic equality and a crit critique of capitalism. Second is the critique of the bounded nation-state itself, a critique that blossoms in Indian writing in the metaphor of borders and continues the spirit of both Tagore's and Gandhi's anti-state philosophies. The third characteristic of the contemporary novel is its movement outward from home to the world. And of course I take that phrase from Tagore's, the home and the world, both in the actual nobility of writers and the exogenous way in which Indian consciousness interpolates the economic, cultural and literary world in these novels suggests a trajectory that will continue through this century. So the conclusion we reach is that the power of utopian thought may well lie in its transcendence of the practical. The power, and hence we may say the utility of Gandhi's vision was maintained by his eminent, adamant, impractical refusal to reduce his vision of Swaraj to a structured political program. Ironically, it was this refusal that gave his vision its attraction, mobilised a whole people, and ultimately conceived the Indian nation. This is, this is, I believe, why utopianism manifests itself so widely and so powerfully <coughs> in post-colonial literatures. My literature is such an important vehicle of the utopian. Literature is not called upon in fact, importuned to produce a practical program in the way Gandhi was. But uh, its power is seen in a, um, uh, a statement by Ben Okri as a rally in support of Salman Rushdie. And he makes a statement that could almost come out of uh, blocks, the principle of hope. So steeped is it in the anticipatory power of literature he says, writers are amongst other things the dream mechanism of the human race. Fiction affects us the way dreams affect us. They share the same instant insubstantiality. They both have the capacity to alter reality. Dreams may be the purer because they are not composed of words, but when fiction has entered into us, it no longer exists as words either. We can control our fictions to some extent, but we cannot control the effects that they have on the world, and we can't fully or wholly control our dreams. The dream mechanism of the human race neatly concurs with Bloch's view of the function of art and literature. For him, dreams are a stepping stone to art, and the dream launches art beyond political commitment. Literature is important because what can be imagined always exceeds what can be achieved but the imagination extends the boundaries of the achievable. The energy and the utility of the genre of post-colonial utopianism might lie in its similar refusal to be reduced to a practical program, because what literature anticipates, what it illuminates, is the power of desire and the power of possibility itself. Thank you very much. Thank you.
we might have uh, one or two questions, since we don't want to take up too much time. Okay. Yeah.